Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here with you all. Just a quick FYI, I've posted a link to the slides for this talk at my personal website. I'm really just trying to pull together a whole bunch of strands that exist in the literature right now. So as a result, I have lots of citations and you can find them all at the end of the slide deck. I'm feeling really energized by the idea of talking with you all about NLP for social good. Um, there are obviously lots of angles that one could take on that important topic. And the one I've chosen for my time here uh, is kind of reflected in my title, which I could read as a claim, really my central claim. Uh, and that claim is that reliably characterizing NLP systems is in itself a social responsibility that we should all feel. I think it's a scientific responsibility as well, but the increasingly broad impact that we're all having on the world means that it has this new or ever more important social dimension. And the impact that we're having really truly is greater than ever before. I've gathered a bit of evidence for that. Let's begin with this picture of class enrollments at Stanford over time. I'm sure that similar pictures could be constructed at your uh, institutions and organizations. Along the x-axis here, I have a timeline from about the year 2000 to the present day. Uh, and you can see that in the you know, about the year 2000, we enrolled at most a few dozen students per year in our NLP courses. Whereas now for the last few years, we have routinely enrolled over a thousand students in the courses each year uh, with the largest increase in enrollments corresponding with the rise of deep learning in the early 2010s, as you might imagine. Now, what I find exciting about this picture is not just the numbers, but also the students' motivations for enrolling in these courses. Many of them are there, of course, just because they're passionate about NLP, but I would say a larger group have, have come to these courses because they're hoping will provide them with tools and techniques that they can use to solve problems out in the wider world. And we could ask ourselves, are we serving the needs of those students? Are we honoring the kind of goals that they have with these courses? Of course, we all know that we're having a huge impact on industry as well. Here's a brief glimpse of that. Kudos to my colleagues at Stanford who work on the core NLP toolkit. According to the Stanford Tech History Report, it's now in use by over 900 companies. And that's really just a glimpse of the impact that we're having. Here's another picture from the 2021 AI index, uh, and it's tracking investment in AI more generally over time. And you can see that it's a picture of year over year increase with the largest increases happening in the most recent years. And another side note about this is that it seems to be a maturing market. So more and more of the investment is being made by large institutional players, uh, suggesting that they're beginning to figure out how to apply, uh, apply AI effectively. And returning to NLP in particular, according to the AI index, we are kind of overachievers. Our progress has been so swift in recent years that we have outrun our evaluation metrics and solved all our benchmark tasks way ahead of schedule. So we can pat ourselves on the back for that, I suppose. And uh, flowing from all of this and interacting with this is the fact that there are, as a result of our innovations and the changing um, industrial market, more applications than ever before for NLP technologies. I think we could all construct really long lists to provide evidence for this. I've constructed one that's a kind of interesting sample in my view. So I think NLP tools are already helping with creative self-expression. I think that tools and techniques we develop can uh, help with language preservation. We can increase accessibility along many dimensions. We can help with community building, especially online community building. We all know that NLP has an important role to play in healthcare and the life sciences. We could help out with fraud detection, securities trading, recommendation systems across a wide range of industries, advertising, of course, surveillance, propaganda, and of course, we're worried about things like disinformation as well. That's a partial list. And if you're like me, you have, let's say, a complex and varied reaction to this list. For some of these things, you might feel really inspired by the idea that your ideas might make their way directly into products that serve these goals. And for other of them, you might be really aghast and trying to think about how you could actually prevent your ideas from playing a role in these deployments. Let's actually do a little bit of a deep dive on a few of them to get a better feel for this, starting with creative self-expression. So before this talk, using a tool from Chris Donahue and colleagues, I collaborated with a BERT model to write the story that you see on the right here. In broad strokes, it's a story of having to give a very high pressure talk. I began this story and BERT took over and took it in an exciting and unexpected direction that is a kind of perfect nightmare scenario for me in the context of giving talks like this. It's not a story I would have written on my own. It's truly a collaboration between um, me and this machine. 
Now, I think that's really exciting. I think we should recognize though that any tool that's gonna facilitate me expressing myself in this way is also at risk of being used for things like propaganda. And that sort of comes along with the technical innovation. Let's think about accessibility, another wide open area. What I've done on the right here is just provide some snippets from a paper that surveys blind and low vision users to find out what they need from image descriptions to make them truly uh, accessible. And the exciting thing about this picture is that they are looking for things as deep as information about the intent or purpose of the picture in the context in which it appears. And I think that just shows that there are very deep scientific questions for us uh, when it comes to image accessibility and also, of course, the prospect of really having a positive impact with those with that work. Healthcare is another area where I think we all recognize NLP could be really important. Here are two brief notes about that. The first one is from the AI index again. It's kind of small, but what it's saying is that investment in drug discovery is AI involved drug discovery is increasing, especially for areas like cancer and other complicated, often individualized diseases. And the exciting thing there is that the complexity of these diseases means that much of the important information about them is locked away in free text. And of course, NLP has to be the field to unlock the value of that information. Another example would be social determinants of health. This is things like the built environment, poverty, access to grocery stores, loneliness and isolation and things like that. It's now widely recognized that those are factors in shaping health outcomes. But since in the modern healthcare world, you don't bill for these things, they don't appear in the structured parts of medical records but physicians express them in their clinical notes because of how important they are. And again, NLP has to be the field to unlock that information. Let's travel a little bit further down the list. This is an amazing report from a bunch of Stanford colleagues called Government by Algorithm. Uh, many of you might be surprised to learn that uh, AI and NLP technologies are actually so deeply embedded in government right now that they actually function to decide what's legal and what's illegal. Here's a kind of nuanced case for that. This is a tool called the ADV fraud detector from the SEC in the United States. Uh, and it is used by people in the SEC to try to detect fraud. And the way that does it does that is what you might expect. So it uses some topic modeling and supervised learning on historical data to prioritize cases. So cases that pass some threshold require human review at the SEC. And in that way, the system is more or less determining which cases get scrutiny and which don't. And of course, we could all think about precisely how that's going to play out. And that's just a glimpse of what might be happening. So obviously, the same kinds of technology could be used to increase surveillance. And finally, disinformation is on our minds a lot these days. This is a big report from Georgetown scholars called How Language Models Could Change Disinformation. The crux of this will be very intuitive for you. In the old days, when dis disinformation was spread templatically, by templatically generated messages, it was pretty easy for us to detect those messages and how they were spreading. But now, of course, we all know, and here's an example, one of the outstanding papers at this very conference is talking about just how hard it is to identify machine-generated text from human-generated text in this new era that we've entered into. And that is gonna open up a whole new world of possibilities for people who would like to spread disinformation. So, you know, that's what I meant when I said I have a complex and varied reaction to this list of application areas. It's kind of hard not to know what to do in the face of all of this. Um, but one thing I can say is that I think this increases our feeling of social responsibility. We're having such a wide impact in so many areas that we really have to start thinking about the social dimension of our work. Now, social responsibility is itself a kind of complicated um, comp um, concept. And there are a bunch of senses that I think are in play for us uh, for this talk. So let me start with pursuit of knowledge as a social responsibility that many scientists feel. Um, relatedly, you might feel a pressure to disseminate that knowledge. That could be a notion of social responsibility that you feel as a scientist, and that could encompass everything from publishing openly um, to functioning as a whistleblower, where that's called for. Many people feel uh, a pressure toward utility, this idea that we should pursue scientific questions that are going to benefit individuals and societies very directly. And then we should all, as part of this, be thinking about the consequences of our work, consequences for the planet, of course, for study participants and subjects, the people that help us with our research, and for individuals and society more broadly. Now, I think that in different of us will feel these pressures differently to different degrees. 
And I think that's totally fine as long as we as a community embrace the fact that at least this list is what we have to be accountable for and all of us should be collectively thinking about these pressures. I also feel that no matter how you decide to weight those pressures for yourself, those notions of social responsibility, maybe one thing that they have in common arguably is what I'm calling here the first rule, which is roughly do exactly what you said your system would do. That was what was reflected in the title for my talk. If I unpack that a little bit, it's like, make sure that you can accurately characterize what your data set or your model or your system does and what it does not do. A big part about this, as you might guess, is disclosures. And this is a sense in which I'm connecting with a thriving area of our literature related to things like model cards and data sheets, other efforts to make sure that we're disclosing important information. And a lot of this is about effectively communicating in context what our systems can do and what they can't do. I wanna emphasize that I think the first rule and the things that flow from it introduces a different set of challenges than we're accustomed to. So we can't quite just continue with the status quo, but I would wanna emphasize that these are robust scientific challenges as well. So no matter what notion of social responsibility you decide to favor, you should feel some pressure to do, uh, do right by the first rule. So I'm gonna have very limited goals because I have very limited time and I thought I would just stake out precisely what I feel I can do. In particular, I'm gonna to have to set aside really important things around, for example, approved and disapproved uses of our technologies, combating pernicious social biases and safety and adversarial context for our AI or NLP driven systems. These are incredibly important topics. And the only way that I can justify setting them aside for now is that I do feel like the first rule is sort of fundamental in the sense that if I can't offer you a, a clear characterization of how my system will behave, it's kind of hard to know whether I'm gonna be able to combat a social bias or ensure safety. So that is not to say that these other areas aren't important. I think they're incredibly important and I actually hope that we can have discussion of how all these pieces interact uh, at the end of this talk. The other thing I wanted to suggest for you as I go through the material is that you have some particular roles in mind as you think about honoring this first rule, do exactly what you said you would do. And the first thing I wanna say there is that please don't have each other in mind as you think about the issues that I raise. I love you all, um, but you are insiders to the extent that you've made it to an ACL meeting. You probably have time to attend meetings like this and to read widely in the scientific literature. And the first rule plays out differently, differently for you than it does when we start to look outward and think about people who are trying to apply our ideas. So I would urge you instead to think primarily about what I'm calling the practitioner. This would be an informed and engaged engineer working out in industry. Um, this is somebody who knows their stuff, but maybe doesn't have time to spend the week at ACL and doesn't have time to read leisurely in the scientific literature because they've got products to build or something like that. And you might also in the back of your mind think about the leader. And for the leader, I'm imagining an executive, maybe a boss in some sense of the practitioner. And crucially, I would encourage you to think about this as someone who has technical training, um, but outside of AI. And that's because as the AI market is expanding, it's increasingly common for people who are regarded as technical to be put in charge of AI strategies or something like that. And to imagine what life is like for these people myself, I like to imagine that someone took me and put me in, in charge of something like derivative trading or protein folding or CRISPR or something, something very difficult that I know very little about. And I ask myself, how would I evaluate proposals from my employees, proposals from vendors, market pressures and so forth. And I think fundamentally, this would just be incredibly difficult. And then we as ACL insiders could ask ourselves whether we're doing right by uh, people in both of these roles, in fact. And just to make this a little bit more concrete, let's imagine a concrete scenario. So this is an actual headline that appeared online. Robots are better at reading than humans. I've provided the link. As ACL insiders, you can probably in two seconds, maybe even without clicking the link, infer that this means something like for the squad data set, a model has surpassed our estimate of human performance. And you can even go one level deeper in the, in the sense that you have a very rich understanding of all the noun phrases in the sentence squad, model, and estimate of human performance. So it's not so interesting to think about you because you've already got a good read on this headline. Let's think instead about the practitioner. What the practitioner might think is, hmm, there might be some value in QA models now, but what would that person do next? And if they look to our scientific literature, would they provide 
guidance, would they get the guidance they were looking for about exactly this issue? And same thing for the leader who might lead to like an eager question, can we automate our question answering systems? And they might feel pressure to answer yes, and they might pr put pressure on the practitioner. And again, we could just think about what we're, whether we're doing well by both of these people. I don't think we can stop headlines like one from appearing, they're irresistible, but we can think about rich communication at two, three, and four. So that brings me to an overview. I have limited time. I'm just gonna to try to do really two main things. The first is talk about benchmark data sets, where the primary thing I wanna urge in connection with the first rule is that we make an effort to delimit responsible use. Then I'll talk about system assessment and the central theme there will be that we wanna connect with real world, world concerns and all that implies for how we assess systems. And then I'm hoping there's time for some rich discussion with you all. So let's talk about benchmark data sets. And I, I wanna begin in a resoundingly positive place here. Uh, in about 2007, I heard Arab and Joshi draw this analogy that data sets are like the telescopes of our field. I think that was really resonant for me, but actually what he said around 2007 was much more critical. He said that we were behaving like astronomers who wanna see the stars, but refuse to build any telescopes um, because at the time we really didn't have a lot of data sets. And Erevin really led the way, I think, toward developing data sets and also honoring them as important first order contributions to our literature. And I'd like to think that he would be pleased with where we've ended up because we do undoubtedly have more interesting data sets than ever before. But there's a pattern here that we need to wrestle with. So this is a under the heading of benchmark saturate faster than ever. This is a framework that, I, that I've taken from this paper, Kila et al. 2020, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And the framework is that I have a timeline along the x-axis going from the 90s to the present day. And along the y-axis, I have a normalized measure of distance from our estimate of human performance, which is the red line given at zero there. So we're gonna track data sets as they surpass human performance. We'll start with MNIST. This was introduced in the 90s and it took about 20 years for us to see a system that was better than humans at this digit recognition task. The second data set is switchboard and it has a similar pattern. I'm thinking here about the um, speech to text task, uh, again, launched in the 90s and it took about 20 years for our system to be better than our estimate of humor performance there. ImageNet, third example, this was released in about 2009 and it took about 10 years for us to see systems that were superhuman in this sense. Now the pace is really gonna pick up. So Squad was relaunched, was launched in uh, 2016 uh, and it took about three years, I guess, for us to see a superhuman system. And then Squad 2.0, it took about two years. And then Glue, and remember Glue is really striking because when it was launched, at least my reaction was, this is probably too ambitious, complex multitask benchmark. We're probably gonna have systems struggling mainly for a long time. And indeed they did struggle for a little bit, but the overall story is that it took less than a year for us to see superhuman systems for Glue. Superglue was launched as a response, meant to be much more difficult, but of course it was saturated in less than a year as well. So that's the first pattern, and it looks like a pattern of real progress. And in some sense, surely it is, because these are significant accomplishments that we could not have achieved 20 years ago, for example. But of course, we all have some doubts in the back of our minds about precisely what kind of progress this is. Another pattern that is emerging when we have uh, this abundance of data sets is that limitations in these data sets are being found much more quickly. This is a bit harder to quantify, but let me try to give you some evidence for this. So uh, along the bottom of the slide here, I have a timeline for the Penn Tree Bank launched in 1993. Timeline goes to the present. And each one of those red dots is a paper. Uh, and you can see that all of these papers are pointing out errors in the pen tree bank. And hat tip to Detmar Moyers and colleagues for leading this effort. A lot of those papers uh, are have him involved. So you see uh, a smattering of papers spread out over time, mostly focused on errors. Let's compare that with the Stanford Natural Language Inference Corpus. It was launched in 2015, and right away you get an outpouring of papers pointing out limitations, and it's much more varied now. There's you know, some are focused on errors, but since it's harder to identify precisely what an error is in a corpus like this, instead they're focused on artifacts, gaps in the data set, and pernicious social biases. And these papers come in like a flood. Uh, here's the picture for Squad. It was launched just, just after SNLI, and you get a bunch of papers right away, in this case, focused on artifacts, maybe because people are 
less concerned about biases in the underlying Wikipedia data for whatever reason. So here the focus is artifacts, but the point is that the artifacts are found more or less instantly. And then finally, ImageNet is an interesting case because it was launched in 2009 and you know, for about six or seven years, it got to lead a quiet life as just a standard benchmark with people doing hill climbing on it in the usual way. And then in the last few years, you get really an outpouring of papers identifying especially biases and errors in that data set. And it feels like any data set that gets sufficient attention is now gonna lead a life like this where instantly people discover the limitations. So that might lead us to think about two perspectives that we could take on data set creation. The first one is kind of the status quo, I've called that fixed benchmarks. And here the idea is that we just establish a bunch of these benchmarks and use them repeatedly as a community. This brings clear benefits. We have ease of measurement because we have just this one fixed thing that we all do comparisons against. And it's relatively efficient in the sense that even though the benchmarks are themselves expensive, they see extensive long-term use. But the drawbacks of course are first that we probably have some kind of community-wide overfitting so we're going to mistake good performance on these benchmark tasks for progress on the underlying capability itself. And that gulf will get wider the more we kind of overfit to the particular benchmark. And the other thing is just building on my last slide, it seems like at this point, deficiencies here are inevitable. If you create a data set and it gets a lot of use, then people are going to start producing papers that identify its weaknesses. And kind of I could summarize this with a reference to Strathern's law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. The inevitable thing is that for these fixed benchmarks, we begin to mistake performance on the benchmark with performance on the capability, and the gulf between them just gets wider. So we could compare that with an inspiring new perspective, which I've called the moving post dynamic target approach to benchmarks, quoting from the adversarial NLI paper. This is gonna bring clear benefits in the sense that now what we're gonna do is create a lot of data sets in response to evolving needs from the world and from the models that we're creating. So this is gonna bring a lot of diversity into our benchmarks and allow us to have evolving goals that could be really responsive, especially to all those application areas that I mentioned before. The drawbacks are that this is gonna be expensive. Undoubtedly, we're gonna collect a lot more data um, but that might be like building ever more elaborate telescopes in Aravind's comparison. And also comparisons will be, will be more difficult. We don't have this ease of measurement anymore because the benchmark itself is gonna be changing over time and old systems might need to be reevaluated and so forth. I actually welcome this because I think the ease of measurement for the fixed benchmarks is kind of illusory um, precisely because of Strathern's law and everything that flows from it. But the fundamental thing that's exciting for me about this moving post idea is precisely that these data sets can be responsive to evolving needs, not only from our research community, but also from those application areas. Now, I've been involved with a major effort to try to make it easy to collect these, these moving post uh, benchmarks that's called DynaBench. You can see it's a large collaborative effort led by Dow Kila at Facebook, but involving many people and institutions. Uh, and the idea is to put models in the loop to, and then have uh, humans create examples that are challenging for those models, but intuitive for other humans. And in this way, we can expose the weaknesses of models and with luck develop ever harder and more interesting benchmarks. I'm excited by this effort. I do confess that it's early days um, and relatively little is known about the dynamics of such dynamic data sets. We have a little bit of evidence though. So an early example is the very productive interaction between SWAG, BERT and Hella SWAG. Um, adversarial NLI is a milestone here in terms of the overall DynaBench effort. Uh, Beat the AI is another really important case, this one involving um, question answering or reading comprehension. And then we have a bunch of data sets that have just very recently been developed on the DynaBench platform, three of them here, and I think there's a fourth that's focused on the uh, NLI. And the exciting thing about this is just, I think we're beginning to see evidence that we can create really interesting, challenging data sets and there's nascent evidence that training on these systems and evaluating on them is going to make our systems overall more effective. But I, I grant that it's early days and that's worth discussion. Bringing this back down to the acts of communication that we need to engage in to honor our notion of social responsibility, especially for application areas and people outside our community. We have a kind of standard template for data set papers, right, where you state your motivation. You describe the construction of your data set. If luck, you do that very carefully. And then you do some model evaluations where you're entering into a funny game of trying to show that your data set is tractable, 
but very difficult. And that's probably why you offer an estimate of human performance and so forth. What I would like to urge is that we add another dimension that would be delimiting responsible use for these data sets. There's an entire section of the data sheets um, effort that's focused on delimiting responsible use. This is the kind of core question. Is there anything about the composition of the data set that might impact future uses? The answer is inevitably yes. And the idea is that we should articulate exactly a full answer to this question. Now, I recognize that the equilibrium might be to have four delimiting responsible use done in follow-up papers, because if you do four for your data set paper, you're probably just handing reviewers a bunch of reasons to say that your data set has some weaknesses. I recognize that that might be hard to change culturally, so I'm at peace with having this be done in follow-up papers, but I think the crucial thing is that we get in the habit of doing it, right? A lot of this is about reaching the well-intentioned user who would like to do something smart with your data set, but doesn't know everything that you know about the context. And in that spirit, let me wrap up this section with a kind of personal story. So I was involved with the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, uh, was one of the most, still is one of the most exciting data set creation efforts that I've ever been involved with. It seemed incredibly ambitious at the time because we took movie review sentences and annotated every single one of their syntactic constituents. So very exciting for compositional models of the sort that I like. Um, but I've been a little bit aghast in the meantime to see how widely the data set and models from the data set have been applied. People have used SST models for things like healthcare, professional evaluations, literary analysis, the list goes on and on. And I'm sort of aghast in the sense that this is a corpus of movie reviews and my initial instinct is to think that you should be using it only very cautiously in these additional areas. Um, but then, of course, I remind myself that we didn't help anyone out in terms of delimiting what we thought was responsible use. In fact, all we do in the paper is talk about how amazing this resource is without thinking about how people would take that message and run with it. And so, of course, I'm encouraging about having data sheets and so forth as being kind of an integral part of the data sets we release in the future. So that's a nice transition into assessment, my second big topic here. Um, there are, of course, lots of things that we could discuss under the heading of assessment. I've picked really three things. So the first I've called our apparent relentless pursuit of F1 and friends, you know, these precision recall balance metrics. Uh, then I also wanna talk about empowering users, expanding assessment out into the people who are trying to derive value directly from our systems. And if there's time, I wanna complain a little bit about how we estimate human performance. So let me start that first topic. And the way I'm gonna do this is just by listing out some application areas. Uh, and I encourage you to think about them uh, because I think you're going to have really interesting perspectives on all these application areas and you might even guess kind of where I'm headed with this. So here's the first one. Imagine the use case is that we're like doing um, safety monitoring for pharmaceutical products where missing a safety signal uh, could cost lives and human review is feasible because we have large teams of people reviewing this literature and so forth to look for these safety signals. But we just really can't miss any warning signs. Uh, contrast that with a use case where we have a massive data set and we really just need to find exemplars. We don't need to find all of them, but we would like to surface the ones that are really good according to some multidimensional metrics. There could be other situations in which specific mistakes are deal breakers and others hardly matter. Like suppose you have some survey data with categories that include like supportive and opposed, but also categories like optimistic and, and positive. Uh, now, confusing supportive and opposed is going to be really problematic for any application of your work, but confusing supportive and optimistic might even hardly matter. They might be kind of overlapping uh, emotions. So, can you know, are we, you know, that's the use case where we have these varied pressures. We could also imagine situations in which we just need to prioritize cases for triage or something given limited human resources. We don't need to classify, but we do need to provide really good rankings of things. You might imagine we have a solution that needs to work over an aging cell network or on very limited devices or something like that. You can imagine situations in which our solution cannot, as a fundamental pressure, provide worse service to specific groups. And if the sizes of the groups vary for whatever reason, this might be directly opposed to kind of F1 and things like that. We might be in situations where specific predictions just absolutely need to be blocked. Certain labels cannot be assigned to certain examples. Certain pages cannot be surfaced given certain queries and so forth. So think about these application areas. And then the fundamental tension I'm pointing out is that someone reading our scientific literature could be forgiven 
for concluding that we think that we should use F1 and related metrics for all of these use cases. Why would they think that? It's not because any of us believe it, but rather because the only metric we really ever talk about are things like F1 and related you know, adaptations for different tasks. Uh, why do we do that? We do that because we're offering a general solution and we don't have particular information about any specific use case. So we know why we're doing it. And we know that if presented with any one of these use cases, we would offer very different answers to how to do assessment. But now think about communicating with people who are just consuming our literature and trying to apply our ideas. It's reasonable for them to conclude that F1 is the one and only metric that all of us endorse. And therefore it's the safe bet to use pervasively no matter what your goals are. And then we should ask ourselves, what we can do to more productively intrude on that discourse and push things in the right direction. Right, think about our practitioner and leader out there. How could we help them make educated choices about which metrics to use? There's another dimension on this. This is exciting new work. Uh, the paper is called The Values Encoded in Machine Learning Research. What this team did is survey a whole bunch of really influential papers throughout machine learning to try to understand in their terms which values are uplifted by that research. They actually identify 67 different dimensions. So I've just selected a few here uh, that pertain very directly to assessment and seem kind of representative. And I'm using font size to indicate how prevalent these things are, how uplifted they are in the literature survey. So no surprise, performance, you know, F1 and stuff right there at the top. Uh, next level down is kind of efficiency. Interpretability, but interpretability for researchers. Uh, applicability in the real world, that's actually encouraging. Robustness and scalability. And then you have to travel kind of far down on the list to start thinking about downstream consequences. So interpretability for users in this case. Beneficence, that is having a positive impact on the world. And then way down on the list are things like privacy and fairness. So that's, so that's a reflecting back to us, our actual practices. I think this is incredibly important for us to be doing in this new era of social responsibility. So again, kudos to this team for doing this important work. My point really in summary is just that even though all of these things are present, we know that when we start to do system assessment, even all those fade away. And very often all we're thinking about is performance. Now there are thankfully a bunch of efforts underway to really combat this trend and offer more multi-dimensional assessments. I've cited two papers that have been really influential to me at the bottom of this slide here. And I think they have shaped actual leaderboards that is platforms people are offering to help with this kind of assessment. I've been involved with Dynaboard, which is part of that Dynabench platform. And again, led by Dow Kila and colleagues. Um, Dawn Bench is an early entry into this space. And you know, hat tip to the Explainaboard crew for winning an outstanding demo paper at this very conference, pursuing very similar goals. So things are changing. And I'm just trying to highlight that exciting trend. Let me offer you an example from Dynabench. That's the case that I know best, and I think it's pretty intuitive. So the way system performance is going to work on Dynabench is given some tasks like question answering here. I have a bunch of systems along the rows that I want to compare and you know, figure out which one is the best in some sense. Now I have five dimensions that I'm going to measure for performance, so for, for, uh, that I'm going to measure for system assessment. Performance is given half of the weight. And then I have throughput, memory, fairness, and robustness. On Dynabench, those all are synthesized into what's called a Dynascore, which is a kind of weighted contextualized view of all of these numbers, taking my weighting into account. I don't need to go into the details except just to emphasize that it does compare all these systems and take all these dimensions as they're weighted into account. And you can see that according to this kind of default standard thing, the DeBerta model is the best. But imagine that I'm in a situation in which ahead of time I've decided that fairness is really important for my deployed system. So I reallocate some of the weight onto fairness and diminish throughput memory and robustness accordingly, leaving performance alone. Even that one change now puts Electra large as the best model here. And of course, other weightings uh, would lead to very different dynamic scorings, hopefully reflecting what I'm actually trying to achieve. And then we're providing pretty direct guidance about which system you would choose. I've so far concentrated on system developers, whether ACL insiders or practitioners or even leaders. I think it's really important in the context of assessment to think also about the users of our system. And the more that we can make them also assessors, I think the better off everyone will be, right? So 
The way I'm going to contextualize this, just one example that I find inspiring, is to think about new directions for this emerging area of neural information retrieval, where we have a major opportunity to think about users as assessors. So just for a bit of context, let's think about how web search in particular works right now. You enter a query in whatever style you choose, and then there's some complicated term lookup into an index that maps terms into documents. And all of that is synthesized in some incredible way to lead you to a ranked list of results. And that's what the user sees. And at this point, it's very intuitive for huge numbers of people to navigate that ranked list of results to figure out what their own information need is and how to address it. This has two major advantages. First, for users, we're tracking provenance so that they can decide for themselves which links to trust and follow and how to combine information. And then relatedly for system developers, it has this incredible property of updatability. If documents change or documents need to be added or removed, we can make those changes to the index and expect them to propagate in expected ways to the experience of the user. The one knock against this approach is really what I've called synthesis here. It is very difficult if a query is only served by multiple documents to figure out how to surface that information effectively for users. So that remains a struggle. And that sounds like an opportunity in this era of really massive language models because those are like engines for synthesizing complicated information in often mysterious ways. And so you might leap to this idea that the whole IR model that we're all familiar with should be radically revised so that users input queries, again, in whatever style, it's munged by a big language model that produces directly an answer. And if it needs to synthesize that information from multiple sources, well, that's what these models do best. And that's just gonna kind of happen as a consequence of the architecture. There are major problems with this though. We've gained the synthesis capability natively but now we have completely lost provenance. We have no idea where this answer came from. And we also have serious obstacles when it comes to updatability because no one can really offer a guarantee that if a document changes, needs to be added or removed or updated, that you could get those changes reflected reliably in the behavior of the system. And I think this is a serious problem to making sure that these systems deliver reliable, up-to-date information for users. Beyond the fact that users, if confronted with an answer, have no way to verify via provenance where the information came from or whether they should trust it. I think that's hugely problematic. But again, luckily, by and large, the field of neural IR is moving in a direction that I think is going to maintain this implicit contract that we have with users at this point. So in broad strokes, the way this field is moving is like this. Enter a query in your usual style. Now we might use a language model to represent that query in a sophisticated high dimensional way. We do the same thing for all our documents, but notice at this point, we've just got a version of the good old fashioned index. It's just a now a numerical index with hopefully much richer, semantically interesting representations of the documents. We also have a really interesting capacity to do a kind of both scoring and generation at the same time. So that if we want to, we can generate rank lists of pages because we've tracked provenance but also potentially synthesize information from a, multi, a bunch of different sources while all the time helping the user track them back to the underlying pages. So this seems like a real victory because we have the synthesis capability that comes from using these language models, but we also have provenance and updatability flowing from the fact that we have more or less a traditional index. I hope this is the direction that the field goes because I think there's an enormous opportunity to improve web search without disrupting kind of the core contract that we have with our users. Final note here, just have to cram this in. Uh, I'd like to talk with you about how we estimate human performance and how changes here might really broaden our horizons. So to make this concrete, let's imagine that you're a crowd worker and you've been tasked with doing something like labeling for natural language inference. So you're presented with a premise like a dog jumping and a hypothesis like a dog wearing a sweater. And maybe you're asked, being asked to verify or add the label neutral. That seems perfectly reasonable. Now you're given premise turtle and hypothesis linguist, and you've been trained that this is a common sense reasoning task. So even if you're a formal semanticist, you recognize that this should be contradiction, even though there are magical possible worlds with turtle linguists. Okay, so far so good, but then you're presented with the premise a photo of a racehorse and the hypothesis a photo of an athlete. And you ask yourself, what label are you gonna apply? Well, the, the first question you might have as human uh, is can racehorses be athletes? Can any animal be an athlete? And you might yourself have firm views on that, 
but you're a crowd worker and you're trying to figure out what the task is asking of you. And the natural human thing is to want to discuss and debate, maybe ask for a dictionary or something like that. Here's another example, a chef using a barbecue and a person using a machine. Okay, you're on board with the fact that chef entails person in a common sense way, but is a barbecue a machine? Again, it seems to just really matter what we're trying to do and what the expectations of the person asking for this work are, right? The human response is, let's discuss. I wanna know more about what you're trying to achieve before I sign a label, because I can see many perspectives on this issue. Uh, we do not honor that at all when we estimate human performance. And that kind of is rooted in the fact that we're not honoring this kind of thing when we think about task composition itself, right? When we say human performance, what we actually mean is average performance of a bunch of hairy crowd workers doing a machine task repeatedly. Nothing about discussion, everything about being forced to choose a label. Now, when we see human performance, of course, we as ACL insiders can immediately unpack it into something at least as long and maybe cynical sounding as my paraphrase here, but we should not have an expectation that outsiders just trying to benefit from our research and apply our ideas will be able to do this quick move from human performance into this more nuanced characterization. So it's really on us to think about how we're going to more efficient, effectively communicate exactly the content of these ideas so that we see fewer headlines saying we have superhuman um, computers at question answering, for example, when actually it just means something more like what's on this slide. And that could be an exciting opportunity. Let me summarize this. So assessment today is one dimensional, you know, F1 and friends. It's largely insensitive to the context, whether we want it to be or not, whether we intended that or not, that's how it happens out in the world. Uh, the terms are largely dictated by the research community, not by users, not by system developers. It's kind of opaque and it is of course tailored to machine tasks. Fundamentally what we do is make things into classification problems or generation problems or something like that. You can imagine that we're on a path to an exciting future in which assessments are high dimensional and fluid. They're highly sensitive to the context or the use case and in turn, the stakeholders, the system developers actually get to set the terms of the assessment and that we're gonna increasingly hand off the power of doing these assessments to our users where it can be the most meaningful. And finally, as a kind of stretch goal, you can, I might imagine that all of us, lead, this, this leads us to pose more ambitious tasks that are more human and less machine tasks and correspondingly estimate human performance in appropriate ways. All right, excellent. Let me begin to wrap up here because I'm very eager to hear what you all are thinking. So I listed out these use cases again, complex and varied reaction is my guess about how our ideas are being applied. And I encouraged you to think about communicating, especially with well-intentioned users listed here as two, three, and four, the practitioner leader and the ultimate end user trying to derive value from a system you've been involved with. And I advocated for the first rule of many, but the first rule as a kind of fundamental pressure that all of us could feel no matter how we decide to weight different aspects of social responsibility in this era, right? But I do want back on the table for us to think about how this interacts with approved and disapproved uses, pernicious social biases and safety and adversarial context and whatever else I've neglected to mention that's really fundamental to our social responsibility. But I do think that the first rule is kind of fundamental uh, and affects any kind of work we wanna do. I wanna emphasize in closing here that what I'm really advocating for is a more concerted translational research effort. And of course, there are thriving efforts for other fields that are translational in this way. I've listed out a few here and I've just picked them because they represent a wide spectrum of different scientific areas from kind of engineering and health and life sciences through education and nutrition. And I think these could be inspiring, not because I think any one of them is appropriate for the work that we do, uh, because AI is kind of pervasive and has both engineering and human elements to it, um, but rather that these individual examples might be inspiring as we think about our own efforts towards, towards translational research. And then finally, let me just summarize and extend, right? So fundamentally, my proposal is that we think a lot about informing well-intentioned potential users of our ideas. And components of that include, of course, accurately delimiting responsible use for our data sets, thinking about assessment in the real world. I would have loved to talk with you about what I'm calling structural evaluations. This would get us beyond simple behavioral testing and really come to a kind of deep understanding of the causal dynamics of our models as a way of ensuring 
that they'll behave in predictable ways out in the real world, no matter what comes at them. I didn't get to talk at all about licensing of data or code or models. I think that's also a really important ingredient here. I didn't get to talk, unfortunately, about how, just as we've seen a shift in how we think about data set contributions, we should be doing the same thing when we think about tools and things like that. Open source, source software, I mean, none of the research we do would exist without the incredible effort from teams contributing to those open source packages. We need to think about how that's a contribution. Accurate naming of concepts, this would get directly into issues of communication. I think this is incredibly important that we, when talking about our own ideas, frame them in a way that will be accurately understood by people trying to apply our ideas. And there's probably lots of other stuff that I'm not thinking of. I'd love to hear additional components that would fall under my first rule there. But I think this is fundamentally an exciting era because the consequences of following through on all these new notions would be that we get more multifaceted scientific goals. I think that's just inherently exciting. And also, frankly, more success out in the wider world as a result of honoring the social responsibility that we should all feel in this era. So thank you.